Hey. Hello. Hey, How You're are you? There we go. Uh, uh, uh. There we go. There it is. How are you doing, buddy? Um, you know, I am the last person who can complain right now. I am doing, got my parents with me. Really? And yeah. They, um, I was, we were having a, a big celebration on a Monday. They flew in on the Wednesday. And that was the Wednesday that Trump announced that they were banning travel to Europe. Right. So they were here from Chicago, fellow Chicagoan. Right. Um, they were here from Chicago for this celebration I was having. Um, and they just haven't left. So we've been here now <laughs> for, for over two months. I know you love your parents. When's the last time you spent two and a half months with your parents? Um, the last time we have spent, my dad's right here actually. He's a big fan. So he's, um, you have to, you can't, so you can't speak freely. Yeah. Um, uh, no, no, dad, when did we, when was the last time we spent this much time together? Well, my dad works a lot. He's a workaholic, much right. like myself, yeah. tennis coach. Um, so he, the most we've ever spent together, me and my yeah, maybe a week or something, you know, my mom is out here a lot for like three weeks at a time. Yeah. But so I haven't spent two months straight with them since I was 18. Yeah. How are you doing? We're, we're again, we, I'm the second to last person, if not the, tied with you for <laughs> yeah. complaining. We're, you know, we're hunkered down. We've been in, at the beach in Mount Luce from, the wow. Of, uh, I guess it was March 7th. Okay. I was supposed to fly on March 8th to Estonia to start a 22 city tour. Holy fuck. Yeah. So we were in New York. I went to do uh, Kelly, Kelly and uh, Ryan. Yep. And we did that show. And then the next day, I, I just, Put a conference call together with my manager and my agents at Paradigm, and I, because I was, you know, it, that's when everything was really shifting, but no one had really said it. Go the tour yet? Yeah. And so I, there was that sort of like, am I overreacting? Am I, am I going to look like an asshole to be the first sort of major artist to cancel the <laughs> yeah. tour? And then, you know, a couple weeks later, say, oh, it was nothing. Yeah. I really, you know, and it's so easy to say that now, you know, but I really just had this feeling like I'd, I'd risk looking like an asshole later than risk people who were coming to see me. And uh, I, I wasn't touring with the band, it was my solo acoustic show, but still it was my tour manager. Oh, okay. Um, there were a lot of things at risk, you know? Plus, selfishly, I didn't want to get, I, the way things were going, I didn't want to get stuck there and not be able to come home. Right. Which is exactly what would have happened I've gone and done the first couple of shows. Um, yeah. So I just, we just pulled the plug and, and the promoters in Europe were amazing. We, you know, who knows when we're ever going to go back to touring, but right now they've rescheduled all 22 shows for the beginning of 21. And so I, so we just came home to Malibu and it's just been, uh, you know, it's been an adjustment in certain ways, just like I'm sure it has been for you, but yeah. I say this every day. We're so fucking grateful to be yep. experiencing this in the way that we are. Yeah. Everybody else. Mm -hmm. No, it's like every time I come across a feeling of like, well, it's so nice to be able to spend this time with my family, or it's so nice to be able to write in this different way where now like, you know, lyrics are my favorite part of writing. And like, so now I'm just like, I'm not going to waste one fucking syllable. Yeah. And then I'm like, but that is such a privilege to be like, how nice to spend time with my family. Because yeah. if you are an essential worker and this, you know, capitalism is so fucked that our essential workers, most of them don't make a living wage. Exactly. Like, so many people aren't being able to actually like see the positive in this time yep. um that every time i even forget saying it out loud every time i have that thought of like this is kind of nice i have to remind myself the um, insane privilege that i have to be able to find the positive in this time yeah well that's you know speaks to who you are and i think that i think most of us who are um you know finding ourselves in much more fortunate circumstances get that and especially when you, unless you're just completely tuned out to what's going on and you're not watching what's happening with these, so, with these essential workers and, and, and the way, you know, like forget, not forget, but like putting aside the, the medical, mm. team, right? The medical community, just these people who are going to grocery stores and, and we're in the thick of it, like way before there was any kind of relaxing or reopening or even discussion yep. of it, these people were going into work 
every day because they couldn't let people down. Right. And, and that's just sort of like, it's so humbling, right? It's, it's humbling. It's shocking. It's, it's inspiring, but it also makes me so angry that the system is so fucked that like, that people who are barely getting paid are going to work to, to risk their lives to make sure that the rest of us can eat. I mean, it's just like, it's a real, a real total mind fuck. But I do have to say what is not a mind fuck is your Twitter feed. And <laughs> <laughs> we were texting about this, but my brother and childhood best friend, like our parents were best friends. And so like we all grew up, they had four boys. I'm from a family of four boys. So yeah. it, um, I mean, I guess I'm kind of a boy, but you get what I'm saying. Um, yeah. So we all, boyish, ish, boyish. Um, we all basically grew up together and they texted me because they were separately talking about how obsessed they are with your Twitter. And then I think my brother was like, wait, I think Justin mentioned that he and Richard are friends and work together and they're both vegans. So they're on like the vegan circuit together. <laughs> and so he texted me and was like, wait, so are you actually friends with Richard Marks? So I was like, I mean, you know, we're, yeah, we're fucking friends. Yeah. And so they um, were very impressed that I knew you. So, uh -huh. I mean, forget all of your hit songs that the whole world sings all the time. By the way, not to keep talking about your Twitter, but you tweeted at some point something about a dentist's office. And yeah. it was like, I apologize to everyone in a dentist's office because you're only going to hear my music. I don't remember what you said, but it was fucking hysterical. What I said was, <laughs> I uh, heard my song at the dentist today. There's nothing wrong with my teeth. I just like to go and listen to my music. <laughs> <laughs> That's... So good. That's amazing. You never know. You might get there too one day, buddy. I mean, I hope so. <laughs> I mean, if they're playing your music in the dentist's office, that means you fucking did it right. That means yeah. it's a classic. Can we, um, because I'm so excited to talk to you about a, a bunch of different things, but um, I want to just, I know it's probably boring for you a little bit, but no. I want to go through the, how you started a little bit and, and just sort of... Um, because we're we are sort of from the same hood. You're from Lake Zurich. Yeah. You grew up in Lake Zurich. Yeah. And I grew up in Highland Park, and obviously years apart because I'm much older than you. I mean, not but, that much older. Calm down. But um, um, what I don't think I ever asked you in our time hanging out together is a, I don't believe you came from any kind of a musical family, right? No, the the no one else in my family is a musician. Right. But. Um, my dad is music obsessed. So like when I got to, you know, I went to an arts high school in Chicago, the Chicago Academy for the Arts, which is the greatest school possibly to ever uh, be a school. Um, and then I went to Berkeley College of Music um, for songwriting. So I'm using my degree to the fullest. Yeah, you are. Um, so, you know, to any parents who might be listening and you think like a degree in music might be insane, it might be but it also might be, your kid might end up being me. So you never, you never know. Dude, if, by the way, if you haven't already, because I didn't look it up, but if you haven't already been named, you know, distinguished alumni from Berkeley, then it's like, that's going to be a big Justin Tranter day coming. I mean, you know, I keep waiting when I'm going to get the cover of Berkeley today, but we can talk about that offline. Exactly. You, know? <laughs> you certainly earned uh, it. Yeah. But um, I remember being in, so I think it was songwriting one because there was like lyric writing and there was maybe it was melody writing. I don't remember the names of the classes, but an amazing teacher named Jimmy Kachulis. And he referenced a couple older songs that weren't like smash, smash hits, but they were hits, right? And I was the only person in the class who had knew, who knew, who had ever heard them. And I knew them well enough that I could like, one of them was, um, my dad's right here again. What's the song mom hates? Is it like Pina something? Oh, Pina, Pina Colada song. Oh yeah. If you like Pina, Rupert Holmes. Yeah, Rupert Holmes. Which is, which is can I just interject? This is what's fucked. I mean, look, that song is still getting referenced. It's the, the, the royalties on that song have just gotta be out of control. Yeah. What is a little bit fucked is that for pe people don't know how, what an esteemed songwriter and creator Rupert Holmes is, aside yeah. from that catchy little novelty song. If, yeah. you, if you go into what Rupert Holmes has created, uh, The Mystery of Edru uh, Mysterious Edwin Drood, A Mystery of Edwin Drood, A Broadway yep. Show. Uh, oh, that's a great show. Dude, he is, and he wrote a song years and years, like in the 70s. He wrote a song for our hero, Barbara Streisand, yep. called Lullaby for Myself, that you need to listen to. I need to. I 
it rings a bell, but I need to refresh it like immediately. Dude, it's like, I, I've spoken to her about it and she, she he produced an album for her. He took, I think it was Lazy Afternoon that he produced with her. Um, oh, wow. Yeah, so this guy's talent is so deep and yet he's the pina colada guy. Yeah, I mean, but in those moments you think about like, at least he's some he's something guy, you know? Right. Because so many musicians would be would kill to just be anything, but it's like, anyway, it's so, like people who say you're a, you're a one hit wonder, and it's like, yeah, one more than you though, bro. One more, <laughs> for real. <laughs> um, but no, so even though like no one in my family is a musician, the music was such a. It wasn't just like a fan; like it was, you know, my dad's like music obsessed. So yeah. I did have a, even though no one was a musician, I had a leg up of like. I just had a, a deeper knowledge of music than most people my age because like I was my you know like everyone says oh my parents are listening to this and this no like this was like a he's like an encyclopedia of of 70s specifically 70s but then other eras too so right um I was the only musician um I was just you know a young age obsessed with Annie and the Little Mermaid and basically any movie where girls sang songs I was in like fully in um and that's kind of what made me want to do it and then did you sing as well back then I wasn't singing yet you know I come from a, a tennis family I already mentioned my dad's a tennis coach yeah. um he and my mom met because he was her tennis coach mm -hmm. scandal um and then that's super hot yeah, it is. Yeah, definitely. And then um, my, you know, two of my brothers have been, one is still a tennis coach. One was a tennis coach for at least 20 years. Yeah. Um, so we come from a very serious tennis family. So I was playing tennis and I really actually loved it. Um, I was uh, obsessed with Monica Seles. Sure. I always say like, she was like my first pop star obsession. Like Debbie Gibson was probably my first. <laughs> okay. Um, and then like, I was, I, I was obsessed over Monica Seles like she was a pop star. It wasn't, it was like, which I guess a lot of people- but That obsessed. was an era when those kind of tennis players, uh, even Chrissy Everett before oh, that- Chrissy Everett, like, amazing. You know, she was sort of like, she was a pop star. They were pop stars, even, even the guys, Jimmy Connors and-, and 100%. Bjorn, Bjorn, Bjorn Borg was a fucking rock star. I mean, John McEnroe was actually a rock McEnroe. star, like fighting people on the court. I mean, yeah. he was like, um, so, so I was, wasn't singing yet. And basically the big turning point was in seventh grade, because I was always bullied really bad through public school. And um, I was always afraid if I auditioned for the musical or like um, asked to be in the, in the elective choir. I was always in like the, you know, you'd have to sing in class and in, in like, you know, random classes. And I would sing and I would sing really loud, but I was always afraid to like take the next step and be like in the elective choir or whatever they called it. Yeah. Cause I'm afraid that the bullying would get even worse. What, but were you, what were you bullied for specifically? Just for being feminine and being, you know, it was, it's funny, I'm actually talking about, I'm working on this amazing TV project right now. And it was like, yeah, the kids were calling me every now and then to be gay and fag and blah, blah, blah. Um, but for the most part, it was just being bullied for being feminine. And anytime they would separate the, okay, boys in this line and girls in this line or, or whatever the fuck it was. Right. Um, whenever you that would happen. Had, you already had a, a, an ownership of your sexuality at this point, obviously, right? I mean, well, this started super young though. So even in like, you know, when I was in first grade, so I wasn't oh, okay. knowing. Um, but you just, so, you just weren't like all these other boys in the class. Yeah, I just wasn't afraid of my femininity ever. Yeah. Um, even though people were, I wasn't afraid of it. And you know, I, I never changed the way I acted, but I did change my choices. I didn't audition for the musical in, in any time until in seventh grade, they announced the musical was Annie. And yeah. there was no, well, I had to. All bets are off. All bets are off. I have to, I just, I assumed they would cast me as Annie, which didn't happen. <laughs> <laughs> but I got to play Bert Healy, the like radio host. Yeah. Um, I had one song, but it was, so once that started, it was over. Like, even though I actually really enjoyed playing tennis and loved it, this, the love for music and singing and being on stage or whatever you want to call it, like made that look, the love I had for tennis look like a joke. Like it was just right. gone. Um, so once the floodgates were open, it, there was no turning back. And then I went to theater camp after seventh grade uh, in Highland Park, where you're from. Yep. Um, I went to uh, Apple Tree Theater Camp there. 
and then was asked to be in the Apple Tree Theater traveling troupe. So then I like met all these people and was- and Now you're getting performing experience and stage yep. experience, right? And so that changed everything for me. And then um, some of the, the girls that I'd become close with in the traveling troupe were going to the Chicago Academy for the Arts. Right. And so that was the big thing. All of a sudden I heard about this school where like you, you would go to your academic classes from 8.30 until 12.30, then you'd go to lunch and then you would spend four hours making music or performing well, or whatever. law school for the arts. Exactly. Yeah. And so um, I went to one semester of public high school and I always say, you know, because I was, I was fortunate enough to be safe at home, the, you know, my parents were open to me going to the arts high school. Um, it's just, I was so young and I lived so far out of the city. So the idea of putting like a 14 year old on a train for yeah. an hour in and an hour out seemed a little crazy, but, and again, I can only say this because I was privileged to be safe at home. I was lucky enough that the bullying got so bad at public high school that my parents were like, actually, if you can transfer now, we'll let you go now. So I went and auditioned um, like right before Christmas and then got to start at the, the arts high school in January of like, halfway through my freshman year. And so then from there, it was just all bets off and it was musical theater obsessed, which I still am into like classic musical theater. I still love, um, but started writing songs because there was just such a huge wave of women in the 90s, uh, fe like female singer songwriters was like, you know, luckily very trendy, even though it should always be trendy, but it had a big moment, the little fair and all that shit. And so then I was like, oh, well, I, I'm not a Broadway star anymore. I am now Ani DeFranco. That's everyone stop asking me questions. Did you really I start am. with her? I mean, was it, was it her and Fiona and Tori and? I think those are the three, yeah. Um, and then Patty, I discovered Patty Griffin oh, probably my shit. senior year. How and fucking brilliant is Patty Griffin? Patty Griffin probably is the, my top three are Patty Griffin, Patty Larkin, and um, Ani DeFranco. Those are my top three. Have you ever seen Patty Griffin play live? Oh, I've seen her play live like 15 times. Mm -hmm. And my, my favorite story is I saw Patty Griffin play live uh, at the Hardly Strictly Bluegrass Festival in San Francisco, which yeah. Um, if we're ever allowed to have festivals, festivals again, everyone should go. It's a free festival in um, Golden Gate Park in San Francisco. Um, and it started as the Strictly Bluegrass Festival, and then it grew. And so now it's called the Hardly Strictly Bluegrass Festival. But I saw Patty play there, and the whole first song, her microphone wasn't on. So you just see the guitar, you see her guitar, and you're like, I was, you know, I'm obsessed. I was close enough to the stage that I could hear that she was singing, like, like a barely, but you couldn't really hear anything. And then at the, Robert Plant walks out because they were in a band together for a while. And I think they were together for a while. Um, and he like walks out and lets her know, because she had no idea her mic was on. Because I guess her monitors were working, but the mic to the audience wasn't working. So she, he like walks out and tells her, and then he gets on the mic and says like, I can't remember exactly, like I she need, we need to restart the show. Hi, I'm Robert Plant. This is the greatest songwriter alive. You couldn't hear it for the first song, start over. And then of course everyone went fucking crazy because it was Robert fucking Plant. Right, right. <laughs> yeah. pretty good endorsement. Yeah, pretty good endorsement. Yeah, so um, then I, because of all that, that whole Lilith Fair movement, I started writing songs and then the, the rest is history, I guess. And so, by the time you get to Berkeley, which is, you know, I've, I've done workshops there and I know that campus a, a little bit and it's such an incredibly, uh, I mean, I think that there's, you know, there's good, good and bad with, or, or there's, there's great and not so great about every organization like that. But I think that what they've done historically overall in terms of encouraging and, and mentoring young songwriters in a less sort of formal and traditional way and letting, yeah. letting young music students and creators find their own way of doing things and find their own voice. What was fun for me when I visited Berkeley is I always, at the end of the, the seminars and the, and not seminar, but the lecture and the Q and A and stuff like that, I would do these workshops and my favorite thing was to connect, like say, okay, who's, who's really, just, who writes lyrics but doesn't write, doesn't play an instrument, doesn't write music? Okay, you come over here because this guy only plays guitar and he doesn't write lyrics and he sings and like, and I, I don't know what yep. happened to any of those collaborations, but yeah. it was really fun for me to, to, to be in a 
this sort of like really cool young think tank of music and to so you spent four years there did you do four yes years? i actually i actually graduated yeah. um which is like a joke at berkeley if you graduate i did it in three years but i i did all eight semesters but right. i did um two summers so it went pretty quick right. um and so like for me the uh the experience was amazing and I learned so much and, but I, I like that you bring up the whole collaboration thing because, you know, when I was in school there and young, I guess when I was young, even up until I was probably 30, it was so ingrained in us. Like you have to write alone else you're not like a serious right. songwriter or a serious musician or whatever you want to call it. You have to write alone. And what's so funny about that to me is like, we don't even realize like, sure. We, Kurt Cobain's fucking amazing. We all know that. But like some of the fills that Dave Grohl wrote are just as hooky as the fucking vocal is. Like they were co-writing. We just weren't calling it that. You know what I mean? Like, um, and so for me, I, I really wish that someone like you had shown up and been like, hey, y'all need to start writing songs fucking together and do it right now. Because yeah. that was never um, even a conversation. Whenever I talk to young writers about anything, I'm like, how many people have you written with? And you might want to go back to writing alone afterwards. Exactly. Like, God exactly. bless you if you do. I can't write a hit song alone. I wouldn't even want to try. Yeah. But like some people can, but I think even the people who can, they need to collaborate because you'll never know what you learn. That's, so, you know? you know, that's such an important thing for the, for the songwriter or anybody really who's, who's listening. You know, I can't, wow, that was so perfectly put because, uh, you know, if I may, you know, I started out writing by myself and had the yeah. same kind of thing. It was like, I'm gonna, and I did write the, you know, probably 90% of my hit songs I wrote by myself, but I That's can't so stress funny. enough that early on in my writing career, when I decided I wanna collaborate, yeah. and collaborate with a bunch of different people, it was, it's the collaborations that I really feel made me write my best songs that I wrote by myself. Mm. The things that I learned from writing with other people and the experiences I had writing with other people, and the sometimes it's even just sort of like, you know, when you're writing with someone and you need somebody else in the room, or it could be with you writing with two other people, three other people, whatever, but yeah. it could be with this one person in the room that's constantly like, no, we can do better than that. No, we can do better than that. Yeah. No, that's good, but we need to be great. Yeah. Those sort of voices and those lessons really translated into my solo songwriting as well. I became my own collaborator in that way. I kick my yeah. own sometimes, you know? Or even I feel like it's gonna be so valuable for someone to tell you what's good. Exactly. The, the one side, like you said, it's like, no, you can do better, but also like, no, no, you're done. Right. You are done. That's really and important too. That's really important We're too. We're thinking it in like, I, a couple of, I know you, you know this too with writing certain artists uh, and songwriters who are brilliant, but they, sort of write past the great to mediocre. All the time. Right? Mm -hmm. Like it's all oh the time. Oh my God, that's fucking brilliant. And then 10 minutes later, they're like, they're rethinking it. Well, well, what if we just change this one bit? And I, I think this is, and then you're like, fuck dude, you've co you totally fucked it up. Yeah, it's, it's, it happens all the time. And it takes somebody to go, no, this is right. Just stick with what the gut feeling that felt good. No, wait, but I, not, I have to ask you a question now though. So like, Cause I just can't imagine it. So like of all those, all the fucking insane hits you've had and you said 90% of them you wrote alone, how, what was your spark? It was your spark a conversation or was your spark like, I need to write a song right now. So let me just think of something. How would you, cause I just, I haven't written a song alone now. Um, I don't know. It's probably been eight years yeah. maybe since I've written a song alone. So like in all those fucking unbelievably beautiful, amazing songs that you wrote alone, what was the starting point? Because for me as a collaborator now, I know how to pick a starting point. I like ask people specific questions when I start to hang out and I can find a starting point. But when you're alone, I don't know how to do it. How did you do it? Um, it, it sort of evolved and, and it <clears throat> continues to evolve here and there. I would say that the majority of time it was a melody. It was a, it was a really melody in my head. I always started with music. I mean, there were a few times when I would have a title or I have a concept and I go, fuck, I got to write a song about that with that title. Or, but I got to say that it's always been for me as a song, as a solo writer, lyrics catching up to melody. Melody. Cool. And, and also having the sort of the onus that I put on my lyrics to really 
speak the way my gibberish lyrics speak in, when I'm writing the melodies. Yeah. Um, and to be as percussive as my gibberish lyrics. And it's such a, you know, it's a puzzle. It's all one, it's all, they're all just these puzzles, these beautiful puzzles, but. Um, did you start singing or did you start playing or both at the same time? You mean in the beginning of my career? As a, no, as a kid, when you were making- Yeah, I started first as a singer. Yeah. Singer, gotcha. I was singing because singing my, my parents had a jingle company. My dad had a jingle company. And no so he wrote, way. Produced, yeah, he wrote like tons and tons of famous commercials, jingles, and he was, but he was also prior to that brilliant jazz pianist and conductor and orchestrator. Wow, cool. Never a songwriter, but just like, he wrote these fucking 30 second hit songs, time after time after time after time for a million different products. Wow. When he started, when his business was booming, um, there were a lot of commercials for like Saturday morning cartoon shows and kid oriented mm. stuff. And so he started, I was singing around the house, I was singing along to monkey songs and you know. Um, and so they put me on some, some sessions and I just, I just- No way. And I had really great pitch and, and I took direction well and I loved it. And I, so I started, I had a pretty good experience as a session singer by the time I was 10, 11 years old. And then wow, you know, playing guitar and piano and stuff like that. But, um, but uh, I was gonna say, that one, of the, one of the things that I, I found interesting about this, the uh, solo songwriting um, impetus, the solo songwriting, uh, what's the right word? mission that mm. you sort of alluded to is once I started having some success as a songwriter, yeah. my, my fuel for writing songs by myself was um, supplying the demand. It was sort of like, rather than have to coordinate with this great songwriter to write a song together, or I, I was just sort of like, what do we need? What do I need to accomplish? Mm. How am I going to reach, the, how am I going to meet that demand that's so creatively satisfying for me? So, yeah, you could say, when, you know, once you start having success, as you know, the, whether it's your label, your publisher, whoever, your manager, they're like, we need fucking hits, dude. We need more hits. <laughs> yeah. Okay. Well, I could probably write some stuff that's super catchy that if it's promoted right would become hits, but I wouldn't necessarily want to play it for you, like my friend or somebody that I respect. So then right. you've got to bridge those two gaps. Yeah, you've got to bridge the gap. You've got to bridge those two worlds into providing the thing that's it's commercial and, and what the people are going to love, but also that you're so fucking proud of. And, yeah. and I found that for, for the most part, at least for a long period of time, I felt like I was the best person at doing that for myself. Yeah. And little by little, I started to just, collaborate more just because I've started to feel a little lonely as a songwriter. I just want, yeah. I want that, you know, and then you narrow it down. You have your, and I want to talk to you about this in a little bit, but I also love as a collaborator, when you find your spirit people. animals, yeah. you find your people. Yeah. You find your, uh, you find your posse, you find your, your tribe. And, and I have a couple of people in my life who I've, I've never walked out of a writing session, maybe not with a hit song or even a song that I think is like exceptional necessarily, but I've never ever, there are a couple of people where if I spend that time with them, it's time well spent. You know yeah. I mean? Yeah. Well, that's important. I mean, enjoying yourself and pushing yourself yeah. is like the most important part of a collaboration. But back to you. When, yes. Because uh, I never asked you this either. So even though you had some success pretty much right out of the gate coming out of Berkeley, right? It was... Centuries, well, that was the big first, the first big song, right? Yeah, well, so coming out of Berkeley, you know, because I'll be, I'll be 40 in a couple weeks. Um, and we're just born I, an hour ago, by the way. No, fuck you. So <laughs> I, I was in a band for a long time before I started writing songs for other people. I was in a band called Semi Precious Weapons, and it was like a glam punk extravaganza. And um, we were like, we blew up in New York pretty quickly. Um, we had four record deals in a very short amount of time. Lots of people believed in us and then lost their belief in us very quickly <laughs> in the industry. Um, it was really over the top. It was, you know, I've always been super proudly femme, you know, because being queer is one thing, but then being queer and femme, it's like asking people to really accept a lot, especially yep. when we're talking 2006 when I started the band. Yep. Um, and... Uh, 
people would get really excited and then really scared. But our fan base was really <laughs> passionate. They were really passionate and they were really um, just with us the whole way. And so it kind of kept us going because like, well, but we show up and there's 1,500 kids here who are losing their fucking mind. So at some point, 1,500 has to turn into 15,000. That's what we thought. Um, <laughs> but... And, but the, the great thing is, you know, me and the guys in the band were all still really, really close. I've been able to um, make open doors for them. They're all amazing. They deserve everything they have. But, you know, the drummer um, plays with Gwen Stefani. Obviously, their tours for the rest of the year got canceled, but I introduced him to Gwen. The bass player was, I um, introduced him to Joe Jonas. And so when Joe Jonas had the Cake by the Ocean DNCE band, the bass player for my band got to be in that. Um, so like, it's been this beautiful thing where we're all still friends and still make the, the drummer is actually an amazing string arranger as well. If you ever need that, he's unbelievable. Right. Just, just this week wrote this crazy string arrangement for BB Rexa. I'm executive producing a BB's album. Oh, nice. Um, so we're all still together and still making music together in these different ways. But, um, the, for me personally, the band was a blast in a thousand ways, but then professionally, I didn't know but it was opening doors for me to meet my publisher, Katie Vinton, who then started putting me in sessions to write with and for other people um, at the beginning of 2013. Um, and so it wasn't quickly out of Berkeley that I had success, but it was quickly into being a songwriter for other people. Right. Then it was a year into that, maybe even a year and I was still the fan was still happening for the first year of my pop writing career that I was doing both I wrote centuries in that time in that first year when I was still doing both things um and I just wrote the chorus with my friend Raja Kumari the chorus and the post chorus um and we thought it'd be like for a rapper so we just wrote a hook and a post hook so that the rapper could do all the verses and then through everyone's teams it got to fallout boy um, and so the you know first from Chicago or no, no, I didn't know our bands never really. Cause we were in this glam world and like pop stars were obsessed with us. So we opened for Gaga. We opened for Kesha. We did a bunch of stuff. Um, but never really, I never crossed paths with, with fallout boy. But so then long story, not short at all. <laughs> the, my first cut in a real way was a top 10 single. And at the time I thought that I was sucking because I wasn't used to that kind of rejection. When you're the artist, when you're the singer, however you want to say it, you know, we would get dropped from labels, but that would be like, you know, we got dropped every couple of years or whatever it was. Right. When you're a songwriter and you're sending songs out for pitch, you are getting rejection every single day. Yeah. There are people either just ignoring your publisher's emails, ignoring your emails, or replying and just saying no. And I wasn't used to that kind of rejection since I was doing theater where you go for an audition and they just fucking tell you no. Right. Um, and so that rejection the first year, because I wasn't used to it, I'm luckily like, I'm a strong bitch. So I was like, it wasn't hurting me, but it was like, I must not be good at this because this is- oh, so, it, so it challenged your belief in your talent. It did challenge my belief in my talent. Or I was like, maybe I'm just supposed to be like a superstar and this just isn't the right fit for me. <laughs> Even though that's, no <laughs> that's, that's the best worst case scenario I've ever heard. Maybe <laughs> the songwriting career is not supposed to work out for me. Maybe I'm, maybe I'm just supposed to be a superstar. Exactly. Wow, so, awesome. you know, I say like delusional positivity always, yes. um, always got me through everything. Um, but so... <laughs> I was like started to question where I was, was I good at this? But now that I know this side of the business better, you know, um, three months into trying to write songs for other people, Kelly Clarkson recorded a song and she had just come off of What Doesn't Kill You Makes You Stronger, which was like the big, one of the biggest songs of the year. Right. And so like, now I know I was, I did that for three months and one of the biggest stars in the world cut a song. I was in the right place. I just didn't know how this side of the business works. Yeah. So I thought I fucking sucked. And then the fallout boy centuries happened maybe six months into trying. And then it came out a year or so into trying, you know, cause obviously as you know, and it takes a while for the songs to actually come out. People don't record them and put them out the next day. Right. 
But so there was that year of going like, I don't know if this is right for me. And now I look back and especially, you know, I, as I, I'm also now a publisher and I sign young writers and, um, you know, trying to break a new writer, no matter how fucking brilliant they are, it's not easy because you just have to get so many ducks in a row. Um, so now I look back and I'm like, oh my God, I was such a little brat. I, I mean, I was 33, I wasn't little, but I was a 33 year old brat thinking that I, this wasn't the right fit for me because I only got like two or three major cuts in my first year. Yeah. Now I'm like, you fucking asshole. <laughs> yeah. Well, you, 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 there's, no, there's no other way to have perspective. Yeah. But now you just, now I remember now, now this is all sort of like from one of our first conversations now and I, and I apologize because it's so, now I realize that there's just 10 years of you coming out of Berkeley and yep. a band and doing all this stuff that you're doing to maybe become a pop star. Yeah. And that it, what, I'm, what I was confusing it with was when you really sort of started to really focus on songwriting for other people, it was pretty fucking quick. It was really fucking quick. Yeah. It was like, now that I know better, it was shockingly quick. Yeah. And I think that, you know, the, the 10 years of the band um, and the 10 years of trying to be the artist myself, the experience of going through these record deals, um, also to the the kind of the mind fuck of when the band first started and like no one cared writing songs was a lot more fun and a lot easier because it was just like no one's listening and even though we weren't massive once you get super fans it doesn't matter how many super fans you have if yeah. they exist for me at least you start second guessing well is this what they want and does this make sense and can i sing this and can i perform this and when i started writing with and for other people it took all of that away and it was just like, if this is about making the best song today. Yeah. And I feel like because I went through all of that as an artist, when I do write with you know, the artists who are great songwriters as well, but they just want a collaborator, yeah. I am able to help them cut through that noise because I went through it. Yeah. Where a lot of people who are just songwriters, it's not a cut to how good they are as songwriters. It's just, I was given this extra skill set that I think helped me skip a couple years yeah um in on the songwriter side of the business because i was able to go no no this is what we're doing and i promise you it's fine it's really just about the song and you have to stop second guessing what someone so is going to think or what twitter is going to say or what all of it is because i've been there and i've done it and like by the time i got my record deals i had lost that freedom and yeah. when you're in the studio you when you're writing a song or if you're in your living room wherever you are you have to only be thinking about the song yeah. And then of course, add your visual ideas and your live show ideas and your artwork ideas afterwards. But when you're writing, you just got to fucking worry about the song and only the song. And so that was like, I think that helped me speed up my success trajectory as a songwriter because I, I knew I had already fucked up that up for myself. Well, so I was able to help other people not fuck it up. <laughs> right. And you know, that particular skill set not only enabled you to do that, but I think it's a, probably a big key to why, you know, when I was looking, and I know, you know, so much of your song catalog, but when I was, before I was talking to you, I wanted to just sort of like see, oh, maybe there's some stuff that I'd forgotten about or whatever I was looking. And it's just fucking mind blowing when you look at the <laughs> song that you've been a part of. Thank uh, you. And, and in a relatively short period of time, you'd say, in the, in the sort of history of your career so far, it's been yeah. over the last 10 years, 10, 10 or 11 years, it's just been, it's really, stunning it's a stunning uh it's stunning in its um prolific nature for sure but it Thank also you. now makes more sense to me because what you just what you just described as as a tool that you bring into songwriting aside from your talent as a, as a songwriter is that sort of um it's almost like project leader almost like oh for sure right yeah, yeah it's like you know, BB Rex always calls me like the taskmaster. Yeah. Like I'm just like, no, no, come on, come on, come on. Like, like Stan, Stan try. And it's like having the confidence to know when something's good and you don't want to fuck it up. Yeah. And you have to just focus on that moment and what's good. And, um, you know, I also find like, you know, like you said, project managers, but it's also like, I want every artist to feel like this song is for 100% theirs and that nobody else could sing this song. Yeah. Um, and I think that that also really helps me because I want, you know, if it's a, a pitch song, as we say, right? So you write it with just writers and you pitch it to an artist. Even if it's a pitch song, I want that artist, if they want lyric changes, if they want to talk about it, I want to know. Where some songwriters, 
And again, it's not a cut to them, it's just how I do it. But for some songwriters, they're like, no, I wrote the song. You're either singing it how it is or you're not. And for me, I'm like, no, but I've been on those stages and I've been in those interviews where they ask you the same fucking five questions for the rest of your life. Yeah. You, I want this artist to really feel like this song is there. So when they get asked the questions, they don't have to make something up. They don't have to feel fake. They don't have to feel shallow. They really believe that they have a right to sing this song. Yeah. And that to me is like, my you know outside of just the craft of writing that part of it as you can see about how passionate i get just talking about it it like really turns me on like it yeah. really makes me feel like creative and exciting like how do i make this artist believe this moment just as much as i am yeah that's amazing yeah can we talk about julia for a second oh always okay so yeah i think that that's a really uh i, I want to just have you sort of t take me through your, your meeting Julia Michaels and your subsequent pretty uh, awesome collaborative life together. Um, and I'll just throw out the caveat that as much as I love and respect so many of the songs you guys have written together, for me, worse than me is the song that- Oh, wow, I love that. that. I, know it, I know it was never a hit or something like that, but I listen to that song regularly. I, like every. Every couple of months, I have to just sort of listen to it. And when I listen to it, I have to listen to it like four times in a row. Yeah. That song wow. fucks me up in such wow. a beautiful way. And Thank uh, you. Anyway, so, so tell me about your relationship with Julia. Yeah, you know, the, the first day I met Julia was one of those like total um, life-changing moments. I knew it was life-changing as it was happening. And it, it was life-changing in two ways. One... I saw, I, well, I'll start actually the other side first because it's a better story because it's the actual chronological order. We got there for the session. Um, I had heard great things about her. She'd only kind of worked with her posse at that time. Um, you know, she was so young. She was 19 when I met her. Wow. Um, she'd been writing professionally in LA um, since she was like 16. She got um, a theme song on Disney when she was like 16. Um, so she'd been in the circuit, even though I was 33 and she was, or I might've been already turned 34, somewhere in there and she was only 19. She um, knew more about this, the whole songwriting LA scene than I did. Um, but she was so nervous to work with new people because um, as not spilling any tea, but she's talked very, very publicly about her anxiety. Yep. Um, and she has a song called Anxiety. You know, so. Um, she was super anxious to work with new people. And so they're like, oh, let's go eat. She like, I, I don't want to write yet. Let's maybe go like, let's go to Subway and get a sandwich and blah, blah, blah. And, um, you know, there was a, 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 a woman on the street that like misinterpreted something and thought that me and Julia were trying to fight her. It was a very weird situation. <laughs> I had asked Julia why she was wearing a winter coat because it was like 90 degrees out. She's like, what? I like it. Like put her hands out. And this woman thought Julia was like, confronting her it was a very strange thing oh. and so like i had just met her but i was like holding her to protect her and <laughs> it was like this thing wow. and then we go back uh to the studio which was just felix snow's apartment in north hollywood and um we start talking and she's like i'm just and i have this idea for a song title called um sick of this and I was like, I just, you know, let's write, we were maybe writing for this girl group on Virgin at the time that I don't even know if they put music out. It definitely doesn't exist anymore, but, um, and so I was like, oh, it's called Sick of This. And like, it's just a love song, but I'll never get sick of this. And then Julia was like, oh, I, that title's, I like that, that title's awesome. What if we flip it though? And like, this relationship is so fucked up and so tumultuous and so bad that I'll never get sick of it because I'm always entertained. And I was like, ah, oh, yeah. That's how I used to fall in love in my 20s too. That is a very <laughs> real thing. That is very real. Um, so then we like the producer Felix starts playing something on the keyboard or guitar or the tr whoever, however it started, I don't remember. And she was like, can I go in the, um, in the closet over there and sing just to myself? Cause she was so anxious to like start figuring out melodies in front of other people. She goes in the closet and me and Felix are like, what the fuck is going on? Like, this is so crazy. Yeah. And then she like flings the door open. And she's like, I think I have something and sings one of the best melodies I've 
ever heard to this day with my song title stuck in the melody. Did she just sing it a cappella, or did she sing? No, the track the track was playing, and so she's okay, singing right. along while the track was playing in the room. She sang along to it, and I had never heard her sing. So first, I you know first I hear this insane melody with my lyric in it, and then you hear then you hear her voice, and I'm like, well, that's one of the best voices I've ever fucking heard. Yeah, and it was that moment where I like knew my life had changed in two ways. One. I had just met possibly the most talented songwriter of our generation. <laughs> but two, that I saw, like, yes, it was my song title and this and that, but really what I was doing was making her feel safe and making her feel confident enough to open that literal closet right. door yeah. and share something with me. And, you know, it was very clear as we then we as unfolded and wrote the rest of the lyrics together and tweaked the melodies together that this was about her life. She wasn't a songwriter making up something that might sound cool in a song. Yeah. This was about her life. And so even though she wasn't an artist yet, meaning she wasn't singing her own songs yet, I was like, oh, okay, this is, this is we're telling her story. And I had already had my band. I had already told my fucking story and worn exactly what I wanted to wear, which was basically nothing, all, yeah. over, the whole, all over the whole world. Yeah. <laughs> and, you know, I like, I had done it. So I was like, you know what? I am so ready to just be here to support and focus and elevate this brilliant, brilliant young woman. Um, and then as she finally released her own single, it made a lot more sense, not only to us, but to the rest of the world. Like, no, my job, I was co-writing with an artist. Even though other people were singing these songs, yeah. I, was, I was, the first time I really discovered my skills of helping other people tell their stories in the best way possible. Um, so yeah, that was the first day of meeting Julia and it was just like mind blowing. And yeah. that song was cut by Rita Ora and Calvin Harris. The first time we wrote together was cut by Rita Ora and Calvin Harris the next day in London, which again, <laughs> Is, <laughs> it never came out because there was a whole drama with that album that is not my story to tell. Right. <laughs> I wasn't asked to help to tell it, so I can't do that here. But um, it never came out, but it was an amazing thing. Me and Julia, 99% chance would have still written together after that first amazing day. But when the song gets cut- The next by, day- the yeah, next it feels, day, it just feels like, oh, this is all, this is all destined. This is all, yep, yeah, it's destined. And then it was able, you know, then we, we obviously, when we still work together all the time, we, we wrote two songs on FaceTime last week. Um, but you know, doing that whole thing really built my skills. So then when I went, you know, she was off touring and I go to write with Dan from Imagine Dragons, um, on my own. And I just put those same skills to work. Of These are his fucking songs. He has a very interesting story to tell with the life he's been through. Yeah. Um, and, you know, again, not spelling tea. He's spoken all of this publicly with the religious way he grew up and this and that and all these different things. Um, I just put that same skill set to work. Of like, no, 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 this, these are your songs. I am not the pop LA songwriter, you know, because Dan lives in Vegas. Yeah. Amazing family. It's like the best sessions ever. You write the songs and you go have dinner with his whole fucking family. And it's a the best yeah. um but i'm not like the pop songwriter from la trying to come in and like tell you what to do i am literally just here to help you be the best version of yourself which those skills were really developed with my relationship with julia but you're and then you went on and have continued to have this uh pretty remarkable success story with julia not to mention all the songs you i'm sure you guys have written that either like worse than me where, where it wasn't necessarily a big hit but these songs that resonate with so many people on different levels. Um, and is, is it just a perception because of the press that I've seen both of you do? Or is, is that a unique, is that a, do you consider your relationship with Julia a very unique and special bond? Oh, it's so unique and it's so special. And um, I think the work that I do with Julia, um, it lives in its own category um and it's not that one category is better or worse it's just a, it's its own category like i think that you know like if i were to stop writing songs you know it's you would look at my catalog or whatever you want to call it 
and the stuff that I've done with Julia, I think it, it lives in this very special place. It lives in this, um, you know, not always, but for the most part, they're the most boundary pushing songs um, sonically. And then I think what's so special too is that they're sonically sometimes the most, because her melodies are just like yeah. always, always a year in the future, like yeah. perpetually a year in the future. So like melodically with her, we're just, it's like this other, this other thing that nobody else is doing because it's her. Um, yeah, I, th I think that there's, there's something really special about it. And we have this like amazing care and respect for each other because it's just been years. It's yeah. been, you know, the songs, the amount of songs that have been released to the public are insane. Yeah. But then there's, there's just as many, if not more, that have never been released. The reason I asked that question, it was a, it was a, it was a leading question in that yeah. one thing that I was thinking about this morning when I was thinking about your songs with Julia and your success with Julia, and then thinking about what I perceive at arm's length as a really special relationship, I can't help but wonder if either of you have experienced or do experience any kind of possessiveness of each other when one of you has success with somebody else, because you both have success with other collaborators as well. Yeah. And I just, I'm curious as if like, there's ever been a time where you, I, I'll just, I'll ask you because you can't speak for her, but do you, ever, yeah. have you ever been like, I mean, you're super happy for her, but is there a little part of you ever that's like, fuck? Yeah, no, it's been this, um, you know, it, I think that we, of course we're human beings and everyone feels every emotion that you possibly can. But, you know, once we really started clicking, we pretty much only wrote together yeah. unless someone said, flat out no to something you know cake by the ocean um you know julia was there for the first couple of days and then it just wasn't her thing right. and you know again no drama we've all we both we've all talked about this publicly and then then the next day we wrote cake by the ocean without her so like there's no way she that just wasn't her thing it, right. it was total like pop rock band which is like my world not her world yep. it was really fucking goofy like the more that we were getting to know joe joe jonas is a lot of things but the main two things he is it's really fucking hot and really fucking funny <laughs> so like <laughs> you know we had to write a really kind of funny sexy song to make it really click with him yeah. um and that's just not what that's not julia's thing so right. you know i think of course you know it's like we're all human and most like, well, maybe, maybe should I try to do that? Like probably not the right session for me and it's probably best for Julia to go alone, but like, should I force myself to be that kind of, and you just have, so we've been lucky that the moments where we had success apart, it was very clear that it just wasn't the right fit right. for either one of us. Right. And then she became a huge pop star nominated for best new artist at the Grammys and song of the year, which luckily I was a, a part of that song. Yep. But she was off touring for literally three years straight. So then like logistically, it just became impossible. So I think we've been fortunate that in this relationship that we have, the moments where we um, had songs that weren't together, it was either by choice or it was by like just pure logistics of her being a pop star now, <laughs> you know yeah. what I mean? So um, yeah, so those, we, we were fortunate that um, our human feelings, uh, there's normally excuses, logistical excuses to be like, well, we can't really be upset because it just didn't make sense. Right. So when yeah. you, guys, you said you were writing on FaceTime last week, is it for her for a specific project or the- You know, it's for, it's for something. It's for, it's for her and I are really into whether we're writing for her or for other people, or say if we're writing for other people, we want to really dive into stuff now. Like we don't want to just like, here's one random song, peace out. Yeah. We want to like make, maybe not the whole album with people, but like the bulk of the album. We want to like yeah. you wanna push ourselves. You want to have your stamp on it. You want to have your stamp on it. Also just like, you know, I, I am grateful for like the LA single chasing pop writing game. It's what's changed my whole life. It's what's made, you know, the quarantine with my family comfortable. Like all yep. these things. I'm so grateful for that pop single hustle. Yep. I don't really want to do it anymore. <laughs> like, I want to like, you know, when you're only aiming for the single, um, it kind of limits where you can go emotionally and go, you know, I was super fortunate enough to work uh, on a, a good chunk of the Leon Bridges album, the last mm -hmm. album he did. Yeah. Um, 
And we were trying to write the best fucking songs that we could, of course. But like, you know, and the first day we, we met, we wrote Beyond, which was the, his, the, the single off the album, right? And I, I'm so proud of the work I did, but it was such a freeing experience because he is so outside of my normal pop world. You know, yeah. Even though Imagine Dragons is alternative and they're you know, the biggest alternative band of the decade, um, those are still songs that are aiming for totally. the biggest of the big. Leon lives in this special world where he's going to literally sell out the Hollywood Bowl and doesn't need the radio to do it. Yeah. Um, so that was such a freeing experience of like, no, we're still trying to write the best songs ever, but we're not trying to like shoot for the radio. And so, you know, I still want to work with huge pop stars, but if I get to do the whole album, we can go, oh no, no, this song is not for the radio. This yeah. song can be as weird or as this or as whatever it you wants to enable, be. I think what you're saying, correct me if I'm wrong, is you want to, you're at a point now where you really want to help artists that you admire to, you want to enable their overall artistic expression. Completely, completely. Have another fucking hit. Yeah, well I think also too that, that that's kind of what has made pop albums stop selling. You know, where you look at hip hop albums that sell like, or stream, whatever you want to call it, yeah. that are consumed like crazy. Where the pop albums, it's still single by single part. That's obviously a blanket statement. But, but I think the reason why is because pop got so obsessed with it's like you get a 12 song album and all 12 songs sound like they were trying to be the first single but only <laughs> one of them only one of them was actually good enough to be the first exactly. single exactly. where you're not getting the other weirder textures and that's why i think selena gomez has had such an amazing last two albums because she is one of the pop artists who doesn't play that shit yeah, she's totally like agree. and that's what she's one of my favorite pop artists because her out al- i still consider her an album artist even though she's exactly had singles Yep. When, I, when she puts out a new album, for me, that's one of the uh, that's one of the artists that I'm going to listen to the whole album. I'm going to try yeah. to not get sidetracked on a text or Instagram yeah. or whatever, and I'm just going to sort of experience the journey of that album. There's yeah. really not a lot of, especially younger pop artists that take you on those journeys anymore. I th- exactly. I, th- I agree. And so it's like, for me, I want to, you know, obviously I, I, my band was alternative. I've worked with, you know, Fall Out Boy and Imagine Dragons alternative, but like pop is my main thing. And I want to, Selena, I'm fortunate enough I get to do it with her, but I want to do it with, you know, every time I get to work on a pop project now, I want to be like, no, 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 we, we want the singles, but we also want the fucking tracks that are, that give different textures so people will actually care about the full project. And yeah. so that's, so me and Julia are really trying to step into that now together, now that she's not touring for the year, but now no one can be in the studio. So right. <laughs> it's a little different, but that was our plan before COVID was, if we're gonna, if we're gonna write for other people besides her, we are, we are diving into the project. We aren't wow. just gonna show up for two days. Yeah, it's really right. awesome. Um, yeah. I need to totally switch gears for a minute, if you will. Please. Um, Fellow vegan. Yes. What was the beginning of your decision to become vegan and, and do a plant-based diet? Yeah, so I, um, I had been vegetarian since 1995. Um, so my, one of my mom's best friends, our, our, all of our best friends, family friends, um, amazing color Tara Soprano that she was one of the people, the first people that like made me feel like maybe I could sing and that would be okay. She also was like the, the, the family friend chef, right? And so she would just cook like army amounts of food every time we would all hang out, which was a lot, you know? Um, my dad is almost 10 years younger than my mom. Mm-hmm. And so like he was... I look back now and I'm like, oh yeah, he was throwing parties at our house every Sunday like a 25 year old does <laughs> because he was, because he was 25. Yeah. Uh, so like everyone was partying. There was just lots of kids there. And so a little safer than a normal 25 year old party, but it was, people yeah. were still partying. Yeah. So she'd make these huge meals for everybody. And one day I was in the summer of me being 15, so the summer of 95 and she was making some sort of chicken situation where it was the full fucking chicken. It was the full chicken, right? And she was like ripping bones out of it. (laughs) And I went, that looks an awful lot like a baby, a human baby, you know, because it's like splayed out and shit. And I was like, yeah, I think I'm I think I'm good on meat. Just that's it for me. 
Um, and then I was, so I was vegetarian for, from 95 until 2015. So I was 20 years vegetarian. Wow. And then um, I think that math is right, but it, it might be wrong. Um, but I think that's, that equals 20. <laughs> I was vegetarian <laughs> for 20 years. Um, and then it was one of like these same typical stories, but I shouldn't minimize it because it's great. I was on a plane, watched a documentary. I don't even remember what the documentary was. It wasn't even one of the famous ones that are actually good. It wasn't even good, but it had enough facts in it where I went, I thought I was being this amazing animal advocate. And for anyone watching, if you go vegetarian or you go pescatarian, any little bit helps the environment, any little bit helps the suffering. Like, we appreciate you, we love you. Yeah, but I, I see did... this, I, by the way, I see, I see this with you, my friend, and I really love it because Daisy and I are the same way. The, the, what we call the vegan police are such oh. a turn off and they don't no. get the big picture, which is even if there's someone who says, you know what, I'm gonna take six months and I'm gonna not eat any animal products one day a week or one yep. day a month. Yep. Like, wow, that's awesome, good for you, that's great. Yep. No, it's so amazing. And so, but then I, this documentary kind of spelled out the facts for me that the dairy industry and, you know, so cows that are being used for dairy and um, chickens that are being used for eggs, a lot of times have the worst life. So I was still, I wasn't drinking milk because that's just insane, yeah. but I was, <laughs> I was eating cheese and you stuff. Don't, you don't like a little squirt of pus in the morning? <laughs> I mean, a little pus surprise. I was eating cheese, which is, then I think about it, it's like, well, so that's just like yeah, milk, same, but same. rotten. It's yeah. rotten. Yeah. And then I was eating eggs. And so when I learned that I thought I was, and I was doing good, right? Because as we just said, any little bit you can do yeah. does help. But I was like, oh wait, the, the, the animal products that I am eating are actually causing some of the most pain, depending on where these animals have been raised and raised is the wrong word, where they've been enslaved. Um, so that made me go, okay, I'm fucking done with this for good. And it was the very typical um, transition of like breakfast self was really confusing for a while without eggs because you go to a restaurant and if it's not a vegan restaurant, you're like, but then what does breakfast look like without eggs and all that stuff that people go through. But as I say, oh, hold on, someone's calling me. Let me, let me cancel them. Sorry, I don't, I don't um, own a computer. So everything's just all on my phone. Please forgive sure. me. So, so I, um, you know, it was like confusing for a little bit of like, how do, what do I eat? When do I eat it? But I always say to people, if you want to do it, you've got to give it six weeks. Yeah. You've got to give it six weeks minimum so that you can really create the new habits. And now it's like, well, breakfast can be anything. It doesn't have to have an egg or whatever the fuck it is. And also I will say I'm coming from a place of financial privilege yep. and I'm coming from a place of location privilege. Yeah. Being in Los Angeles makes and vegan- and, and if I may, we're also coming from a, a place of, of sort of history privilege in that going vegan 20 years ago, 10 years ago, yeah, was probably more challenging than it is now. And just in terms of enjoyment, because if you love food- For sure. You, you know what I mean? So it's like, it's, it's become so much more enjoyable to make that transition. Completely. Um, and so, but anyway, you know, I understand it's easier for me to make these transitions and do this, but um, it just, I just makes me, honestly, it just makes me feel so proud. Like I feel like every single day that I don't consume an animal product, that I am not only helping the environment, first and foremost, I think the environment needs to be the first issue, but I'm not putting another being through pain. Yeah. Um, and it's funny, even some of the young writers who I work with and I love, they'll, it's just so interesting to me when you tell someone you're vegan, like, the crazy questions you get asked. There's this, and I'll actually just say her name because she's the fucking best and she means so well. And she's signed to my company with me and Katie Vinton. Her name's Kennedy and she's an unbelievable songwriter. And one time she said, okay, but wait. So if someone had a gun to your head and to a cow's head and you had to pick which one? <laughs> and I was like, wait, how is this a yeah, part how did, of the how did, conversation? What made you go there? <laughs> like that is not a part of the conversation. No. But again, I don't think she might be saying this, is then we, after having these crazy conversations for a couple months, because we would work together a couple days a week for a couple months, 
she actually admitted, like, I'm asking you these crazy questions because I feel bad that I am not finding the discipline to make the choices that you are making. There you go. And I thought that that was really, and she's young. She's, I think she's 21 now. When we were having these conversations, she was like 19. Yeah. And for her to be able to like come to that, I just thought it was beautiful. And there's, you know, I think that um, there's a lot of hope out there in the, in the sort of plant-based movement is really coming to a head right now, especially with COVID. Yeah, for sure, for sure. Yeah, yeah, especially because of the of the of the meat packing and uh, the meat industry being sort of like a hot spot. You know. Yeah. Interestingly, two things. Uh, you met my son Lucas. You know, I have three sons. Yep. We're all grown men, and they're and they all. When I because I was veg I was very similar to your situation. I started eating red meat when I was eighteen. So a long, long time ago. Yeah. But I was pescatarian and vegetarian for the majority of my life. And then I switched to a plant-based diet about seven years ago, six years ago. Awesome. And in the beginning of it, and I was never lechery about it, really. I mean, maybe some people would disagree with that in the beginning. Because there's that sort of like that first year where you're like, everybody needs to be doing this. Yeah. But my sons gave me so much fucking shit about it and Daisy about it. And to the point where it was just sort of like every time the subject would come up, they would just mock us with mm, bacon and shit like that, right? Now, yeah. interestingly enough, just from hanging out with us and watching, you know, this documentary or whatever, uh, two thirds of my sons are almost, well, one is 100% vegan, one is probably 80% vegan, and the third is like, All right, I'm really, um, what, 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 could I, what could I use for eggs? Dude, just go get just egg. I'll send oh, you it's the best. Just egg is the best fucking. We have a new thing, by the way, called folded that we just tried this morning. I haven't tried it yet, but I read about it. Dude, I, at first I was sort of like, eh, and then we tried it. It's fucking awesome. Oh, I can't yeah, wait. So much easier. And then the other thing was, I never really put this thought completely together in my head, but I have this vision now because of something you said a minute ago. You know, like if if two people meet somewhere in a social setting, and one of them says, uh, so "What do you do?" and the other one says, uh, "I'm a lawyer," and they go. Harvard, Yale, what law school? Now it's almost like when vegans run into each other, you're like, which documentary? <laughs> <laughs> no, completely. <laughs> it's always a fucking documentary that's that changed yeah. the game. Yeah. No, yeah. it's like, you know, and I can't even fucking remember what the documentary was. It was like something on, I, I think it was American Airlines, but I don't even know if that was true. Like, sounds like the one of the ones that, first ones that I saw, which was called Food Inc. And it was really an expose of the chicken and poultry industry. That might be a, a care what it was, but it was just like I was still sort of having the occasional like I wouldn't I wouldn't not eat a little bit of chicken in something once in a while or whatever at that point. It was rare because I just didn't really yeah. like it. But when I saw that documentary, that was the end of that. And that was probably twelve years ago, thirteen years ago. Yeah. No, it's um it's amazing. And I just think it's so great that the conversations are happening more and more now and there's so many more options and you know, the, the CEO of McDonald's just said they're exploring yeah. a vegan option. And I just think it's going to be... And Impossible be, Foods has really been a game changer as far as I'm concerned. Yeah, Impossible Foods and Beyond, Beyond. Foods have just like, it's just changed absolutely everything. Yeah. And then I have to like, there's so many of these great like meat alternatives that I, then I have to remind myself just like how fucking good like a cucumber is. Yeah. Because a cucumber is fierce. Yeah. <laughs> dude, dude, when we don't have any of the sort of um, modern vegan alternative stuff. And we just go with a strictly plant-based or vegetable-based meal. It doesn't yeah. involve any of like the fake this or yeah. substitute that. It's just the best, you know? Yeah, it's the best. Yeah. It's the best. Luckily, luckily I'm married to an incredible cook who, who's, who's switched from being an incredible, uh, you know, she's Cuban. So she had like all these, her favorite Cuban recipes she's now uh, changed into vegan versions of those. And oh, wow. I'm well Amazing. Fed. Do you follow Tabitha on uh, TikTok and Instagram? Yeah, she, uh, Tabitha Brown, right? Yeah. Yeah, Daisy's obsessed with her. She's amazing. I, I, I've only seen her a couple of times, but she just showed me a video of her yesterday and it reminded me, and I, so I have to start following her. Yeah, Tabitha's like my favorite. Yeah. Just not even vegan Instagram. She's my favorite Instagram. Yeah. It's, it's just like great. pure magic. Do you know about the whole su support and feed initiative no. that Billie Eilish's mom is doing. Oh yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, we just did, um, we just did a, an event that, that benefited them. Yes. Oh, amazing. Yeah. yeah, my really good friends run this um, unbelievable company called Conscious Cleanup um, that 
is for, for the most part, for the entertainment industry, when people used to have events, <laughs> when that was possible. And you know, they, they, the, the women that started it are this amazing couple and they worked both in different parts of the entertainment industry and they would see just how much waste was coming out from events, from just basic nightclubs, from, from film sets, from TV sets. And they started this company um, to basically um, deal with trash consciously from all these special events. And now they also have this thing that I have here um, called Conscious Pickup, where you get like a box um, for the things that your recycling bin doesn't take. So batteries and clothes and certain types of, of um, like pack, plastic packaging, right. um, styrofoam, all this shit. Um, but so they partner with Support and Feed though, which for those of you who don't know, Support and Feed is in New York, Philly, and LA. And uh, at certain vegan restaurants on their takeout menus now, you can donate a meal. And so now my friends who run Conscious Cleanup, they do the whole delivery service for, for Support and Feed. So Conscious Cleanup brings like, you know, they brought like 500 vegan burritos to a hospital and then whatever many to a homeless shelter. And a really amazing, amazing cause. So for any fellow vegans out there who are trying to make sure that our essential workers um, are getting healthy, good food during this time, check out Support and Feed. Absolutely. And yeah. one more thing before I wrap it up and let you get on with your day. I, I yeah. didn't know, I knew that obviously because you, you're you very outspoken and you, you've gotten a fair amount of press as well. Um, I did not know that you were now on the national board of directors of GLAD. Yes, I've been on the board of GLAD for about three years, two years, three years, somewhere there. So one of the questions that I really have never gotten to ask you is, do you, do you recall, I'm already like fumbling with the way to ask the question. What was the light bulb moment that made you go, I'm going to be an outspoken activist versus yeah. I'm going to be, I'm going to live my life the way I want to live. And because when you became an activist, you, you take it uh, so proudly and so seriously. And I, I almost see as much press about you for your activism in, in, in the LGBTQ world than, yeah. you, which is really saying something. Yeah, no, I mean, there's probably more presses for my activism than there is for my music. And that makes me so proud. It's crazy. You know, it's the, the big, to answer the first part of your question, the big turning point for me of, of that was when I was in high school. And um, I, there was a family friend, a school friend, a, a, enough people all very close to my life that had been diagnosed with HIV positive. And this was 1996, 1997. Um, so it wasn't late 80s, but it was still a very, very scary time yeah. um, for the HIV and AIDS um, epidemic. And so I created, I just like kind of said to my friends, like, we have to do something, you know, in that beautiful, beautiful teenage um, delusion of no one can tell us no. Here's and I, yeah, and I walked into the, you know, office of the, um, our head of school. Um, it was always a very liberal place. So she was not a headmistress. She was the head of school. Uh, we didn't gender, <laughs> we didn't gender titles like that, even in yeah. the nineties and walked into the head of school. And I was just like, yo, <laughs> I'm doing this AIDS benefit here. You have to give me some sort of performance space. You have to give me a date, maybe two dates, blah, blah. blah. And you know, she was a brilliant woman named Pam Jordan unbelievable you know I, I i didn't realize how lucky i was our head of school this fierce brilliant woman woman of color a black woman um that was such an i don't i didn't realize what a gift it was for me to have that representation you know you have a at the time she was single a single black woman running the biggest arts high school in the midwest you know that was like and so she was like because to, to me that was just I was so used to the school. I was like, well, this is just what the school is. But I now stepping out, I'm like, that was some amazing representation that we we're also lucky to have. Anyway, she's like, yeah, sure you can do it. But like, who's going to do all of this? And I just, without even thinking, said to her, well, my friends, my probably said my fucking friends are going <laughs> to do all this. <laughs> and she was like, great. All right. Well, you have to have one, you know, um, faculty advisor. So let me know who you want. 
And so I picked Miss Russ because she could play piano and she was really sweet. So she could accompany all of us while we sang. <laughs> and, um, we just did it. And it was in that moment. And we raised, my parents, of course, helped. And they asked their friends to donate things to a silent auction. And we just did this whole thing. My mom and her friends like made food for people. Like it was like a sit down dinner, which we, it's, it's point, point, it still goes on 20 years, 23 years later, this thing I created wow. in high school. And so that was the moment where I was like, oh, I think this is, I, this is my favorite thing. Like the combining art and activism or art and fundraising or art and advocacy, whichever word you want to use for it. Um, you know, cause sometimes I'm even afraid to use the word activist. Cause I see like, I don't want to call any celebrities out, but <laughs> I see yeah. like random reality stars who like put activists in their Instagram bio. And I'm like, but are you? So, I, <laughs> so you're, I it implies that you're actively doing something. <laughs> yeah. So anyway, no shade anyway, but like whether it's fundraising or advocacy or activism, combining those things with art, I realized at 16, 17 years old, like that was my shit. And that was my favorite thing. And then to see every single year, this event still happen at my high school that I'm still very involved in. I do fundraising for, and I, donated the money to build a recording studio there and all this stuff. But that was when it really turned for me. And then, you know, in the band years, um, just being super feminine, six inch heels and full makeup, trying to become a rock star in a post 70s world. Cause in the seventies, that would have been great. In, sure. in, in 2005, people thought I was fucking insane. <laughs> so um, my activism for all those years was kind of just my existence, right? Just right. like, yeah, you, I'm, uh, you, were yeah. A, you were a walking advocate, advocacy. Exactly. And so, but then when I started writing songs with and for other people and started making all these celebrity connections through it and having my own money to be able to donate and having access to other people with money, um, the first big turning point in that was when the Pulse tragedy happened, the yeah. shooting in Orlando. And me and Julia were um, on tour with Selena at the time. We were in Miami writing with her while she was on tour. And uh, woke up to all the news of what happened in Orlando. So we were right there. And I just kind of said to Julia and Selena, like, I have to get on a plane. And like, I was so new to having any sort of financial security that I almost had guilt from it, you know, of like, I'm a queer person and... I should do something with this yeah. financial security. I wasn't like, I only had a couple hits. So I wasn't like, I didn't have financial freedom yet, but I had security. And I was like, I'm sorry, guys, I'm going to go get on a plane. If you write something great without me, donate the fucking money. I don't know. <laughs> I'm right. out of here. So I got on a plane to go to Orlando and I just showed up at the LGBT center in Orlando and just started buying bottles of water and buying suntan lotion. And we were bringing them to people in line to donate blood um, and that's how I met everyone from GLAD because they, of course, flew to Orlando as well. And I got connected with them through my lawyer, funny enough. Um, not funny enough, he's amazing, but like for your lawyer to connect you to like the, the CEO of GLAD is not a normal thing. Right. <laughs> so met with them and we, me and Julia wrote this huge charity single called Hands that had everyone from Britney Spears to Mary J. Blige to Pink to Casey Musgraves to Selena um, and more and more. And so that was when in my new life as a pop songwriter with all of these connections and with all of like, celebrity connections and financial connections, that's when it like really took over my life. And it's, um, I probably spend just as much time as I do on fundraising and activism and advocacy that I do on music. It's, it's, a, it's a maybe 60 music, 40 yeah, but um, I get that. I get a real sense of yeah. that. And it's like your commitment to the most important things in your life is is impressive. Well, thank you. Uh, I mean, thank it'll you be interesting to see as you get a little older, the choices that you'll make in terms of your time. And yeah. I'm curious to see that for sure. I, I'm curious to see it too. I'll keep you posted. <laughs> well, you know, hopefully, hopefully I'll kind of know. Um, yeah. Uh, yeah, that's just amazing. I mean, the fact that you that you 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 started something in high school that fired you up, and then now you're you know on the national board of directors of That's really fucking amazing, dude. Thank that's you very amazing. much. Um, Thank you. I, I said would I was going to wrap up, but I have to ask you this one more question before I let you go, go. for it. Yeah. 
And I know we, we sort of, any of us who do interviews, we sort of hate these kind of questions, but I'm gonna do it anyway. And it, I'm not uh, relegating it to your most or the favorite or anything like that. But just give me one example of an artist hmm. who you ended up writing with who was a real what the fuck is happening in, in my life moment. <sighs> I mean, there's been a lot of them. I, I would say, you know, BB Rexa was one of those moments where she had written Monster for Rihanna and Eminem. She had written Hey Mama for David Guetta, Nicki Minaj, and she sang the hook, which she wasn't credited for singing the hook originally. Um, I think she had had, woohoo, it's just me, myself, and I for Jeezy. So, so she had had these three or four big hits, but the it was kind of, you know, they were features and they were, there. it was kind of all over the place. And um, I went in not knowing what to expect. I didn't know who she was as an artist. I didn't know, obviously she had written hits, but like they were very down the middle hits, right? Very mainstream down the middle hits. And which is never my favorite. I like the more left of, I, I like when they're yeah. huge hits, but I like more left of center and the weirder stuff. Yeah. But I was like, I don't know what to expect. And then she just started singing melodies and I was, and well, first she started talking and I don't know if you've ever met her or listened to an interview. Yeah. She is a fucking firecracker, Staten Island, isn't afraid to say anything, but is also very woke and like aware of, I know woke is kind of a played out word, but she knows what the fuck she's talking about. Right. So she's not just talking trash, she's talking about real shit, but like in a very Staten Island way. <laughs> <laughs> like, I was like, who the fuck is this girl? And how come none of these hits have ever represented that. who right. she is? Because right. she is a very big personality. And then she played me this song called Ferrari. Um, and her and I talk about this all the time. And I was like, this song is amazing. Uh, I finally hear, now I'm, I just met you. And now this song actually sounds like the person I'm talking to. Um, I think you really need to focus on this lane and this world. Um, and I was like, I, I'm not, I don't work at a label, so I'm not gonna tell you if that song's a hit or not. I just know that I finally hear you in this music, but I think we can take it about 10 steps further. And that day we wrote I'm a Mess, which is um, her biggest song that she's ever had without a feature. Yeah. And so, and she started singing melodies and the melodies are insane. and. I started suggesting lyrics and she'd be like, oh my God, I love that lyric, but like, is that too much? And I'd be like, nothing's too much. Right. It's like, this is your project. We aren't pitching the song, it's for you. If you, if you like it, it then it's okay. It's not too much for you, it's not too much. Exactly, and so we just had this amazing day together and she was, as you can hear in the song, she was not in a good place and she was not happy <laughs> about a personal thing in her life. Um, and so that was probably one of my biggest, because like, even with Julia was such a, mind-blowing experience that you know will go down in history as one of the biggest experiences of my life but i had already heard from so many people that this girl was one of the best writers yeah. in la at the time you know imagine dan imagine dragons blew my mind but we already i already radioactive was already the biggest right. rock song in the decade like we knew what was happening right. but bb i was not expecting her to be the writer she is and the person she is and so that was a big one and so now we're almost done with her album which is fucking amazing. And to executive produce that with her um, is such a, such a cool, cool experience. You, these things that happen to you, you know, you design them, I, I know you know that, but it's when they happen, and when they happen in such a satisfying way, you know, whether it's the way you created this event in your high school and now you're on the board of directors of GLAAD to, you know, the, this sort of momentous, writing session with this girl you kind of knew a little bit about but she completely blew your mind and now you're executive producing her new album and she's huge, and she's a massive massive star Those yeah oh i i just can't i'm i'm so fascinated with the idea that we design this shit in our lives and i wish more people understood it because they would yeah they would live more happy and successful lives if they just knew how to harness what you've learned how to harness yeah well i think it's also too it's like you know it's um well first of all thank you but second of all i think it's you know, people a lot in like sort of spiritual Instagram <laughs> conversations yeah. want to say, you know, speak it into existence and blah, 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 whatever the fuck it is. But it's literally just like, 
having the, the confidence to actually say it, not only to yourself, but to other people. I had the confidence to say to BB on that first day I met her what I was thinking. And I think that you, can, you have to be respectful and you have to be considerate when you say these things. You can't be a piece of shit. I'm not recommending right. anyone say horrible things to anyone because you think you have the right to. I'm saying like, if, you, if you're a writer or whatever it is that you're doing, like, if you think that you have the insight on something, don't be afraid to share your opinion. Um, but also make sure you're being super respectful because I saw a great, great thing on speaking of Instagram the other day, which was like, did you, did you, did, did you will this into the universe or was it white privilege? <laughs> and, you know, that's the question you have to ask yourself. If you are a person, question. Of, if you are a person of privilege who is making sure that you say what you want in this world, make sure that you are doing it respectfully and aware Absolutely. of your surroundings. Yeah. Absolutely. Well put. Yeah. Dude, I, I, I could do another hour and I hope that we do in the next couple of weeks and it doesn't have to be for this. Just like, I, I love yeah. catching up with you. I'm so You're the best. And I, I've, I've felt like the minute we met, I just felt like, oh, that's like, my life just got a little bit better. I, I think Same. you're an awesome guy. Same. No, you're, you're amazing. And send my love to Daisy I will for sure. and to all your sons, but especially the son that we worked with. Yes. And um, I hope to talk to you soon. Stay safe and healthy and say hi to your family for me. And hopefully when we can all be in public together, I'll see you at 10 more vegan fundraisers. Yeah, you will. <laughs> all right, sweetie. Care, pal. See talk you. to you soon. Bye. Thanks. Bye.